Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Think, making sure microphones are working here. Um, nice to have all of you here. We're going to have a, this a little different kind of platform than we discussed. Uh, I think the, the starting point of this was a conversation I was having with David Helgeson at, at Barcelona about automobiles as platforms. Um, we did some analysis at EA a couple of years ago looking at where people were spending their time. And one of the great opportunities that we saw was the time spent in various transportation devices, especially automobiles. Um, we can talk more about that later, but that's where this kind of started from. The notion that automobiles have become computing platforms is no longer a, a, an exotic idea like it was a couple of years ago. I think all of you kind of recognize that's going on. So we have a few different people here who have a few different relationships to the businesses that we are in. I think you're going to be surprised by how much their software platform problems are like ours and about how they're starting to walk into areas where there are um, problems we have solved before. So without further ado, um, to my left is Frankie. Frankie's from GM's uh, Silicon Valley Lab. I don't think it's Silicon Valley Center for, give me the right name. Advanced Technology Silicon Valley Office. There you go. So those <laughs> of you who live in the Bay Area may know uh, where Fry's Palo Alto is. You drive by pa Fry's Pal Palo Alto, you drive right by her office. Right next door. Right. I, I don't know. I, don't, I must have driven by it 150 times. I personally was always incredibly curious about what was inside of that place. And so this was my opportunity to find out. And what I discovered was that Frankie has a distinctly un-GM-like office that most of us would recognize it from other Silicon Valley offices. So thanks for coming to see us, Frankie. Thank you. Um, I, ha I have our friend here from NVIDIA who's going to tell us about his platforms. My wife drives a Tesla every day and she lives she likes it. And she loves it. And uh, she lives with your both software and hardware being a key part of her experience every day. Uh, Oriel joins us from Dragon Racing. Oriel's a veteran of more than 200 IndyCar or Champ Car races of various kinds, winner of Montreal. See here, the Molson Montreal Grand Prix when he raced for Newman Haas. Yep. Possibly the most dominant single team in the history of it, Cart, that's for sure. I think you guys won about 14 races in a row or something like that that year. Um, and Oriel, for the last couple of years, has been involved in Formula E, which is the electric racing series that was put together by the FIA. And he's not only been a driver for that group, but, but a major part of the management of that group and making that transition. So that's who's here. Um, we have a few different things to talk about today. Um, the first of those I thought would be interesting to talk about is engagement. So we spend a lot of our time, especially if you make mobile products, worried about customer engagement, how, how much time they spend. I think you'll be surprised to see how the people on this panel are using the techniques that we've had before. But why don't we start out by you showing some of the film that you brought to show us. Okay, I think we're starting. Oh, sorry, Oreo is going to show us film, first of all, about <laughs> Formula E. started out wrong. Yeah, I brought a little video, basically, that shows what Formula E is, um, so you guys can judge. There's a revolution in auto racing. Race to the future is about to start. The tension is really starting to build. I think it's something new and uh, I think the people are going to be interested. It shows the skill of the drivers being able to go to the limit. For me, this is the best racing ever. There's a revolution in auto racing. Revolution in auto racing. The E stands for electric. as you can. Just push, push as hard as you can. And don't ask questions, just go for it. Thanks to walk the inside line! Walk the smooth! World Class DJs whip up the party atmosphere and entertainment is provided for the whole family. Pretty much a sellout here this weekend. Formula E's all action style thrills audiences the world over. They come to race and they talk to you. It feels like they know you already. By using the Formula E website, app or social media platforms, fans can vote for their favorite driver. He also has the fan boost, Nelson Piquet Jr., which will give him an extra 30 kilowatts of power. It's extra power. It's something that at the end you can make a difference. Formula E heads to some of the world's most famous cities. 
I've been dreaming about having an electric car race here. We are right now going to places where no one has been before. Green in Miami. Green in London. Green in Monaco. And it's a really good start. If you look at the venues, we go to the fantastic. It was one of the key reasons for me why I wanted to come to Formula E. It feels great to be the winner in Formula E. Thank you very much. <laughs> want is to be the framework for better technology for electric cars. So that's exactly what Formula E is about, pushing technology. The whole world should be run on clean energy. This is fast, very, very fast clean energy. It's innovation and it's also fun, it's entertainment. As exciting as it was for the spectators, that's also how much I think all the drivers enjoyed it. If people don't say Formula E is exciting, then I think they didn't watch that race. This is the beginning. I just look forward to how it grows and how fast it grows. So Formula E finished their uh, Formula E finished their first season last year. Um, Nelson Piquet, who you saw at the Nelson Piquet Jr., as you saw, at the, became the first champion. Um, the team championship went to Renault, but the Second place team championship went to Team Dragon with a big rush at the end of the season, coming yep. from fourth to second in the last two races of the season. So um, these guys did great. Anybody who hasn't seen a Formula E race, they're not like other motorsports races. The end is never determined. Literally, you can have a guy leading with, you know, it looks like a presumptive lead with two laps left, and he's just gotten the energy quotient or the thermal quotient wrong, and suddenly he's not even on the podium. So. Unlike most motorsports today, it's really fascinating to watch. So thanks, Oriel. Frankie's got some slides to show okay. about what she does at GM. Do I click to start? I think so. There we go, okay. So what I wanna do is I wanna start off by giving you an overview of my team in Palo Alto, and then I wanna to talk to you a little bit about one of the ways that GM has been getting into gamification. So the mission of our office, the Advanced Technology Silicon Valley Office, or ATSVO, is that we're basically GM's eyes and ears in the ground in Silicon Valley. We're there to define new opportunities uh, between the collaboration of automotive with other industries. Obviously in Silicon Valley, the primary focus is on consumer electronics and software, so we've done a lot in infotainment. But we look at all aspects of technologies and also trends that could be impactful on the, on the vehicle and also on uh, vehicle ownership and the automotive industry in general. We do follow a, a path where we scout the Silicon Valley fire hose and try to filter it down and assess into a more manageable set of things that we bring back to our headquarters in uh, Michigan because really what we want to do is we want to see, see our staff get on the road or see it in a service that GM's deploying. And we can sometimes go through a prototype to do that, but I don't want to go into detail on that. What I want to talk about is what we're doing in gamification, and this also allows me to introduce a brand new car that we've got coming out this year, very exciting the Chevrolet Bolt EV. This is gonna be a 2017 model, which is coming out this year. This was announced by our CEO, Mary Barra, at CES last month. This vehicle is gonna have a 200 mile electric range, and it's gonna be around $30,000. So we're pretty excited about this and the segment that we're coming into in the market. This is a look at the infotainment system. So we've had the Volt on the road for a number of years. And one of the things that we've learned from our electric vehicle customers is that they're really enthusiastic about knowing how well they're doing in terms of economy. They wanna know how eco-friendly they're being, they wanna know um, what their miles per gallon equivalent and some other statistics are. So we've got all that in the infotainment system. GM also has the OnStar brand and this allows us a, a connectivity to the vehicle so that you can take information outside the vehicle. You can use this app to do all the things you've seen in the commercials where you lock and unlock the doors, you can start the car from the app, you can check your fuel level, it's really awesome. But in the Bolt, you're also gonna be able to check all of your eco stats. And the thing that you're gonna be able to do also is you're gonna be able to compete against people, uh, Bolt owners uh, across the country, um, and you're gonna be able to compete on things with your miles per gallon equivalent and your, uh, let's see, what other kind of things your miles per charge, and a whole bunch of other statistics that are important to EV drivers. So what we want to do with this is to encourage people to be as eco-friendly as they can be. And that's, you know, kind of our first idea of how to get into gamification. There are potentially a lot of other things we might want to be able to teach drivers how to do. 
And you know, I'm excited to be at a conference with a bunch of gaming people who probably have really cool ideas that none of us ever thought of. You know, my group really embraces the open innovation, so I want to hear your ideas, and I want to know how else we can, uh, you know, be integrating games and interaction into our vehicles. So, there we go. Fra Frankie and I were talking about this when I was trying to talk her into coming to do this crazy thing. But one of the experiences I told her is when I first bought a Prius. Those of you who've owned a Prius. The backup, backup alarm in a Prius is just the most annoying thing in the world. You put it in reverse and it goes beep, beep, beep inside the car. Not outside, inside. It's like, I know I'm going backwards, don't tell me. <laughs> so, so I know somewhere in there is software to overcome turning that off. So I'm going to look, I did what all of you would do. I went and looked on the forums and I did find what I was looking for. But what I was truly fascinated by was the Prius forum was like about this much about how to use the car and about this much about how it calculates mileage. And people were having knockdown, drag out fights over how they calculated mileage and whether it was correct. Just for context, we're talking about Prius owners here, arguably selecting for the least competitive people on the planet <laughs> who are having fist fights over their mileage. So imagine what would happen if you did that with a competitive, with a, with a car with a competitive pedigree. Uh, I wonder, that, think that would be really interesting. Um, so the, so the last, our friend, uh, Sean from, from NVIDIA has been working on a number of things for us in the past. He's worked on test hardware that made um, the GPUs that we've always built great PC products uh, capable for. He's been with NVIDIA for a long time. What he's done that I think is new and interesting for NVIDIA is that they have treated the entire automobile business as an ecosystem. So they're not just worrying about building hardware for Teslas or for other cars, but they're worrying about building software for it too. And I'll let you talk more about that. Yeah, you might be thinking there's a race car driver, there's a big OEM why NVIDIA guy is talking about the cars. Uh, we've been in the car business over 10 years now, I mean, some of you maybe you don't know, but if you have a BMW, Audi, or Tesla, that, that big screen that everybody loves, it's driven by NVIDIA computer. And we've been also involved in several different other markets, like a supercomputing nation, fastest supercomputer is powered by NVIDIA GPUs, and we also involved with lots of simulation technologies. So we've been thinking that how we can bring all these technologies into car, and we started with the infotainment uh, systems that you see all this music play, navigation, and everything. But last three, four years, we are heavily investing into autonomous driving. Uh, autonomous driving is something that it's all about software. I am a software guy. I know that hardware guys will not like it. But it's really all about the software. Uh, <laughs> now, you have to have an extremely powerful platform. Uh, it has to perform what you like to program. But at the end of the day, lots of smart people come together and write software. That brings kind of the, your ecosystem thing. We don't believe that any single company will be able to crack this puzzle. I'm talking about not only driving on the highway, I'm talking about driving on the urban environment, understand all those difficult situations, and car makes the right decision better than human. We call it superhuman because most of the human drivers are lousy. That's why there are lots of accidents. If the car drives like a lousy human driver, you don't, you know, any serve any purpose. It has to be superhuman. That's what we are working on. So what do you need? To make this superhuman possible, you need a superhuman brain, which means that it has to be fast. Uh, and we've been talking about bringing supercomputers to the cars. Five years ago, people said, you guys are crazy. Cars have nothing to do with computer. But guess what now? The new product that we just brought to market, and it's going to be shipped uh, end of this year or early next year, it has eight teraflops. Eight teraflops. Those are our engineers uh, in this room. They know what I'm talking about. Uh, this was the supercomputer 10 years ago, which was a giant um, in the room. So you have this. We have a platform that you can pl uh, program on it. And there are so many people programming that includes OEMs, that includes us, that includes ISVs, IHVs. And we are making a huge progress. I think you're going to see truly self-driving cars. I'm not talking about only drives 30 seconds and gives the control back to you truly self-driving cars in the next few years on the road. And we are super excited that once the car drives itself, what you're going to do, obviously, we're going to go back to our core, and we're going to play games, I hope, in the car. So that's how it ties to <laughs> I'm trying to, to get that time back. That's, that's how it ties to, I think, what, what Richard here. is doing. <laughs> well, I think it's, um, to me, a lot of uh, that innovation has been interesting, and it's a big change. I'm not sure that everybody in this room quite gets it, but. Uh, six or seven years ago when we talked to a certain other automobile company from Japan that has an office in San Diego. The rest of you can figure out who I'm talking about. Um, 
when we talked about the software platform that they had in their cars at the time, they described its capabilities, which was inferior to every single piece of entertainment device that we had at that time, and that they had a seven-year upgrade cycle. That it took seven years for them to put a new system in there. That means seven years to get new system software in at that point of time. It was so prohibitive. It's been a real revolution in the car business where software and the flexibility to upgrade those systems in the cars is really quite a new concept for automobiles and essentially coming into its full flower in the last couple of years. So I think it's a huge innovation in that ecosystem space. I thought I'd talk a little bit about engagement. Um, we'll come back and talk to, about the both, but I want to talk about uh, Fan Boost in Formula E. So Formula E has a, an innovation called Fan Boost. Why don't you tell them a little bit about how Yeah, it in, in general, Formula E, uh, A, because it's a new championship, they've, uh, and it's created by people that have been in racing for many years, they've been able to start from scratch and add things that make sense. First thing was being electric. Obviously, it was, right. was a way to the future, taking the races where the people are to in city the streets. Centers, yeah. And then they understand that it's not just racing. Every, every sport is battling, uh, like, a, like everything else, audience, right? And you need to engage the fans. It's the only way that we as audience really want to see something nowadays if you're engaged. And in racing, uh, it's difficult because you know, uh, uh, you're, 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 there's, there's one steering wheel. There's, there's teams behind <laughs> it, but at the end of the day, there's still a driver. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not totally driverless so yet, so far. Um, we'll so it would, be, it would be hard to, uh, to manipulate that end, but they find a good way to do it is um, they created the Fan Boost, which is the, the most popular driver for that race. Uh, three, actually, of the 20 drivers will get a little extra boost uh, if they've been the most voted on Twitter. So it's, it's, you know, it, it started away like drivers and teams obviously ask for that help, that promotion, it, 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 you know, it, it involves social media and, and, it's, and it's helped a lot. I mean, it's, those of you who don't pay any attention, Formula E, I would, I would make the case that Formula E's social media engagement right now swamps the rest of motorsports combined. The, yeah, the total absolutely. number of Twitter feeds on a daily basis out of a Formula E team, there's one per team for sure, one per driver per week per sure, and those are all trying to drive your attention back to the next race and to get involved with that fan boost. I can't remember the numbers, but yeah, you know, last year was only the first season of Formula E, and we got over a billion interactions on, on, on Twitter alone. So right, so it's big, a huge yeah. impact, and and people are voting for those um, votes. I, one of the drivers for Team Dragon is Jerome D'Ambrosio, who I happen to have met. He told me a story that we were laughing about. Neither of us quite believes, but it's a nice story anyway. I'll tell it anyway. He got passed by Nelson Piquet Jr. going up the hill at Monaco, and he said he smiled because he knew that, that the reason Nelson could pass him was because the fans had engaged with him and made him pass. Now I know. That was a problem because that made him think, how I'm going to get the fan boost next, and sex tape started to come up. And that, That's right. Uh, it never happened, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. But <laughs> We've talked about this a little. We, we don't really believe he was smiling because I have yet to meet a race driver who smiles when anybody passes him. So, <laughs> I, I, but but it was it showed the drivers. I think it, for the most part, the drivers in Formula were very engaged with this new concept of connecting to fans. There isn't, you know, in Formula One, it's very hard to get at a driver. Formula E, it's very easy to get at a driver, to talk to a driver, to be engaged with the driver. And so they've done a great job of that. And how they've embraced, in particular, social media to accomplish that's been amazing. Um, the things you're doing uh, with the Bolt and all the new social media there, what are you expecting from people like us to help you um, get more gamification into that? What are the things you'd like to see from us? Well, like I say, I feel like, you know, we're coming from automotive, and there's a lot of people in automotive who are, let's just say nicely, not gamers. <laughs> and I don't think that we have a good sense of what people, well, first of all, how to engage people appropriately while they're driving. We obviously don't want to cause distraction while people are driving, but how can we engage them in a way to make them better drivers? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we think we can talk about what people need to do to be better drivers, but we don't necessarily know how to get them to do it. This is something we've talked about in the past where I was like, well, we don't want to nag people. You know, we've got systems in our car right now um, that will let you know if you're following someone too closely. I don't know about you, I put those on least naggy and it's still <laughs> annoying because it's either beeping or it's vibrating the seat, which is less annoying, but it, it's beeping and alerting all of my passengers that the car thinks I'm following too closely when I'm really not. And so, you know, what is the right way to implement a system like that to make people better drivers, you know, leave more following distance? 
there's a million other things that we could teach drivers to do that would make the whole world a safer place. We just don't know how to, you know, I think with, with the skill set that we have, the systems that we have are not as engaging and are not creating the behaviors that we want. So uh -huh. can we learn from, from I, I think we can learn from what, what folks out here have to offer and can tell us about how to do some of those things. Uh, so one of the things that I, that I saw in your thing was you had a list of kind of every driver in the world. Yeah. And we, we everybody here participates in a business where the, they have those massive high score lists. And the problem is if you're not in the first 10, you don't care much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The challenge that we found is actually what you really care about is how are you doing relative to your friends. Mm -hmm. So it's like that guy on the top of the list. If I don't know who he is, I don't care. But you know, my sister, I care a lot that I'm doing better than she is. And so I think one of the things you do is to start. How do I narrow my community so that I have a competition I can win every day? We were talking about the game you were playing. It's yeah. completely about who you're playing against. And so I think a lot of that engagement is about the who, not just the what. It'll be interesting to see if we can do something more to help you there. Um, one of the uh, other things that's coming up is the whole world of autonomous driving, and I think each of you kind of has your own little version of that. Why don't we let you t talk first about the efforts you guys, you kind of started on that, but talk first about the efforts you guys are making. Yeah, our goal is not develop autonomous driving ourselves. Our goal is to create a platform that we enable everybody else to drive. I mean, we are working with all the OEMs, we are working with all the ISVs. It's for us, it's all about the ecosystem, all about the developers. Because at the end of the day, this is a very complex problem. You need all the smart brains to try to solve the same problem. And if you look at how autonomous driving evolved last 20 years, maybe first 10 years was slow, last, I mean, five years, then it got a little bit faster. But last three, four years, it's going like a hockey stick. You know why? Because there are every single university is working on autonomous driving. Every single car OEM is working on autonomous driving. There are lots of ISVs, IHVs working on the autonomous driving. If you put so many people together, yeah, you can send the rocket to moon or Mars. I think autonomous driving is one of those phenomena that will happen because of all these people. And NVIDIA's goal is to create a compute platform, a computer that anybody can program it and do different things to be able to solve this big puzzle. So there, where we see our role and every single innovation that we do to enable others to get this role. And uh, we are doing lots of software than hardware before, because as I mentioned, autonomous driving is way more uh, hardware than software. And our software is the base, but we expect that application will be top of that. And applications uh, using lots of artificial intelligence is one of the goal that we are pushing you were saying that the current cars are a little dumb. They give you this warning. But if you're a human driver, you know that you are in control. You're driving. If it's kind of a artificial intelligence comes into the picture and cars start thinking like human, I think that car-human interaction will be way more smoother than we have today. Today is more like somebody is you know, giving me a stick if I'm changing the lane. But if the car understands what I'm trying to do, I think it's going to be much better human-machine interaction and eventually maybe it's going to be just machine interaction, but no offense. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you see, so these are really a collection of systems that are all talking to each other. Yeah. It's not one process that runs in an autonomous driving system. Do you see a world where third parties would ever provide part of that system? Maybe not the component that actually drives the car, but maybe supplies extra information or different kinds of sensor information, or maybe more individualized information about me as a driver. Is that a uh, accessibility that you imagine being available in your ecosystems in the future? I think application level, yes. Core level, I don't think that it's going to be open system because there are lots of security and safety risks. Sure, sure. That liability. But what I see, maybe maybe you're not going to write the application for the self-driving, but you can write applications that self-driving enables those new type of applications that maybe it's not possible today. Right. I mean, uh, we were talking outside that if car drives itself, what you're going to do? I mean, I don't know whether you guys drove any car today. It's kind of fun because you're fascinated. Oh, it's driving itself. But you know what? After 10 minutes, it becomes very boring because you're not doing anything, but you are still sitting behind the wheel. It's a worse combo, in my opinion. If you can create new things that entertain me during this journey, I think that's going to be the next big thing. And I think this audience might do phenomenal things in the car like you are doing today on the PC and other environments, because car is a very captive environment, by the way. 
You cannot go washroom break. You cannot go some others. You are there. And if you are there, then entertain me. That will be amazing stuff, I guess. I, I, I have an interesting follow-up on that. But it, what's also interesting, of course, has been the other technology forces that have come to bear on this, Google and other folks mm -hmm. who normally wouldn't be in the automobile industry. What that's done is completed the circle of who's working on it. I also think it's been interesting to see the car companies in particular think about it in a different way, much as how parts of our business have started to think about software as a service, subscription-based services. GM, I think, not only thinks about it as a product, but they think about it as a service. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, again, thank you for the good lead-in because <laughs> we just made a big announcement in January about making a huge investment in Lyft, a car sharing service, and the main, or one of the big car sharing services, the main reason that we did that was because we think there's a really good way to leverage car sharing um, to help bring autonomy into the market. You know, autonomous vehicles uh, and automated vehicles, those systems are going to be really expensive to start with, first of all. And they're also, we've got a lot of users who have never experienced this technology before and have to learn to trust it. And so ask, asking a customer to come and pay an extra, you know, huge amount of money to buy an automated car when they're unfamiliar with the technology is a big ask. But on the other hand, if you've got a service such as Lyft that you use to get around for some or all of your trips, if every once in a while or, or just, you know, at some point, a car shows up without a driver and says, I'm gonna take you to Safeway, I'm gonna take you to the grocery store, you probably trust it for a few blocks and say, well, I'll give this a shot. Okay, you know, what can possibly go Especially wrong? Especially if it's got a discount. Yeah, for, for, you know, for $2, <laughs> I'll give it a try. And you'll have the good experience and then say to your friends, you'd never guess how I got to Safeway the other day. You've got to try this, go call Lyft. And so there are ways for us to, to gradually roll out a technology in that manner. Um, it gives us time to, to or it gives the public time to get used to it. And it gives us time to, you know, have the technology out there, amortize it in a slightly different way, and bring the cost down for for single uh, owner vehicles in the future. Yeah, I, I've been lucky enough to know a guy named Jeff Huber from Google X. You may have met him before. He's, I, I think he's a great guy, by the way. Good race car driver too, by the way. But um, he, uh, when he and I have talked about this in the past, we described the magic trip of Grandma to see the grandkids across town and how she gets in the autonomous vehicle, and the autonomous vehicle starts to show her all the things that her grandchildren have done since the last time she was there. So suddenly all of those things, she's got 10,000 subjects to talk with her children the minute she shows up. And well, you know, this is another thing as well, is when you have sharing services, when you have something like Lyft, you know, people have already discussed, this opens up car usage to a whole set of population of people who can't. At some point, grandma's going to get too old to drive. My parents, you know, are, are, are had or are reaching the point where they're getting too old to drive. We're all going to get there. There are people with dis disabilities, not, not, not us. blind not us. users, you know. Well, you, you could, Paul Newman, 83, won his last race. That, that of, out of it. <laughs> True. But, you know, the likelihood of getting to the point where you can't drive anymore or the number sure. of people who have disabilities who have made it that they've never been able to drive with a sharing service, um, you know, can get where they need to go. Well, as soon as you've got an autonomous service where you've got, you know, more availability to get where you need to go directly, um, it really opens up automotive to a whole new set of consumers. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's suddenly the service is about getting there and getting you prepared for where you're going. It's just a completely different relationship with transportation. It's about the trip and it's not necessarily about the vehicle. About the product. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's a yeah. new way of looking at it. Really interesting. Uh, I, well, so Formula E has their own I was going to say, you know my answer, I'm not excited. <laughs> you know, I want to I drive, but I, I understand, I think we all understand it's a necessity and it's going that way. Same as electric vehicles, I mean, I've been a motorhead all my life, but, you know, electric cars make so much sense. And what Formula E is doing a little bit is saying, yes, driving electric cars is efficient and there's all these rankings of how eco-friendly I'm going to be. Of course, if I have a choice, I'd rather be eco-friendly than not. But Formula E is saying, but it's also cool, can be fast and fun. So when we're all out there at the end in I don't know how many years being driven around, then it's all going to be up to you guys and create great games so we remember how fun drive used to be. <laughs> well, and, and to that end, <laughs> so, so one of the things that Formula E has announced that they're going to try and do next year is something called Robo Race. Anybody else hear about that? What Robo Race is, is it's an autonomous driving racing series that will be a support series for Formula E. In other words, when Formula E cars are on the track, there'll be other cars that will be driven, driven by algorithms 
that will be driving around the track racing against each other. And those will be relatively inexpensive teams that will be laboratories for innovation in this space. I think that NVIDIA is working a little bit on that. Yeah, we are super excited uh, because uh, until now, uh, by the way, we love race cars and we love watching it. Not uh, the drivers. <laughs> not the drivers, too. we love everybody. Uh, uh, but I think this is fascinating that, uh, like I mentioned, there are so many smart people out there and they would like to innovate. And if you can give them a car and if you can say, you have everything you need, all you have to write algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms that these cars drive and race each other, nah, still a human behind it, remember. None of things gets done in the lab automatically. I mean, there are now lots of people in the lab racing each other that they are not in the same area, but they are racing each other. It's a competition. I will be very and interesting. Super excited very about interesting it. in many ways. Uh, also to see, like, up to now, we, the driver, is the one knowing that when you turn right and you touch the wall, mm -hmm. how much money that's going to cost. <laughs> so now the engineers, for once, also have some responsibility in that. Like that. Well, engineers are very good at to spend money, so don't worry about it. They will spend <laughs> as much as they can. Uh, and also, in the future, maybe we are thinking that we were talking about uh, that outside. Maybe it could be a human and machine race. Maybe human sits in an environment that drives the car remotely, and some other cars you know, competing with the pure AI on the same field. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. And probably it's going to reach the speed that you couldn't reach today. So it might be a faster game. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I, one of the things we were talking about was that kind of racing, what, the robo racing style is writing algorithms that sit inside cars. There's an assumption, I think, in some fronts, that this is going to be a laboratory for the people who are building self-driving cars for the streets for. I happen to be one of those people. I look at the problem, and it looks exactly like a computer game, video yeah. game, I, AI problem. It is not about worrying about the squirrel coming across the road or the baby carriage. That's not what it's about at all. It's about how do I get around that corner the fastest? How do I learn that? I think there are really fascinating approaches. I think you know, we've talked I about that. I think it will be very things. interesting for sure. And not only that, like how are you going to beat the other 19 algorithms around you that That's are right. thinking the same, right? That's right. So. I mean, wh one of the things that we talked about it at lunch the other day was, to me, if I were going to attack the robo-race problem, I'm give away my best idea here, but I'll just give it away anyway. <laughs> it, what I would do is I would attack it like a, a driving game AI problem, mm -hmm. but I would turn everybody in the world into helping me. So I would build an application that ran on mobile that allowed people to drive the racetracks that were going to drive with the parameters of that car, and I would pay attention to who figures out how to do the fastest laps or how to pass best in this corner. Mm -hmm. I would essentially turn my audience into my laboratory and then derive our best algorithms from them. Suddenly that gets back to that notion that you're trying to do with Fan Boost, which is the big team. How do I make it so everybody feels invested in my win uh, come Sunday? And, and so I, for me, that's a really interesting opportunity for how gaming can kind of fit, plug yep. right into that um, when that time comes, but we'll have to see. Um, let's see here, I, I think there was one other thing that was maybe kind of interesting to talk about, um, and, that, and that is where do you see it going forward? What are the things that, um, that the gaming business could bring today. We talked about gamification for you, but what are the, the things that you expect? What are the ways that our graphics capabilities are going to get to show off their best on a 21 inch or a 26 inch or whatever the size of the next one is going to be in the next one? What are the things that you wish you were going to see? And then for Oreo, I know you're a huge simulator fan. You've used them your entire life. Increasingly, you do not get in a Formula E car unless you are good in a simulator. So simulator driving is kind of the base level thing to get into motorsports today. How can we make that better? How can we get people better prepared? I think those are all interesting questions. So we got about five more minutes here, and then we'll give you some answers. Pick one of those subjects you guys want to talk about. I'll, I'll go with what you were saying about simulators. Like, I, I'm 40 years old. I've been racing all my life. And I've seen the evolution. Like, in, uh, I, I come from Europe where Formula One is, where they have the biggest budgets. And for the last, I would say, uh, 15 years at least, Formula One teams would start spending um, 30, 40, 50 million dollar uh, budgets just creating a simulator uh, that not only will give the driver the, the feedback of a new racetrack, but they would actually end up deciding the set of the suspension of the car going towards the next race. Um, nowadays, the games that you guys do are so much closer uh, um, for $20, uh, you know, <laughs> just because A, software is, you know, is evolving so quick and we have all the data 
and, and it becomes so real that you don't really need now the $20 million simulator to get an experience that is as amazing as almost driving, right? Um, and that's what you guys do with, with games, that you make us be, believe we're, we're experiencing that, and now with virtual reality, it's only gonna get better and better. So I, I, I see it like getting you know, closer and closer really to, to how lucky I have been uh, for 30 years driving things fast that you know, everyone will, will be able to experience that. Uh, if you're a professional race driver today, you're gonna spend probably two hours in a simulator for every one hour in a race car? Oh yeah, uh, or, or way more. more. Way more. At the end of the day, is way cheaper than be out there burning tires, fuel, or electricity crashing. You know, right, yeah. and you get a lot, a lot better, a lot accomplished, uh, and and you can hit the, you know. The, but the Formula E has, I think it's half a dozen test days before the season starts, and then you have one test day or two test days during the entire year. So if you don't practice in a simulator, you don't practice. Yeah, absolutely. Like, not only Formula E, racing in general, uh, every championship has to reduce the number of testing, uh, testing days because if you think about it, when you're testing, you're, you're spending as much money as when you go racing. You run as many laps or more uh, with the same risks, with no audience, with no exposure, no sponsor, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you tend to try to do as much as you can off track, which means simulator and analysis and yeah. algorithms. And for you guys, I know you use simulators to test your U, your UI systems with customers before even the platforms yeah. exist. Yeah, and that's a key part of that development process for you guys. Absolutely, we've got you know a lot invested in in simulators for various reasons, and, and it's really interesting. I think I was talking to you guys at lunch about the fact that I'm very prone to simulator sickness, and we've got our simulator guys who who know how to you know make them work really well. And they can, you know, kind of gradually, you know, get you used to it so that you're not going to be as sick. But, you know, it's, it's hard to do that testing when you get a lot of people who are getting sick. With the new VR systems, I've found that the, the better those systems get, the less sick I get. And, it, you know, I've got one of the guys in my group who's, who's looking at those kind of things. And it just makes me so happy that I'm not getting sick trying to play with these things. And I know that if we can use virtual reality to do more of our testing, um, as opposed to the, the simulator setups that we have now, it's just going to get better and better. We're going to be able to get more data. And it's the amount of things we're going to be able to learn is going to be fantastic. Yeah, when you and so Oreo and I went and drove some pretty fabulous simulators. But the most fascinating thing to me was the eye tracking stuff. So mm -hmm. the, the, this guy's system had designed in eye tracking so he could tell when the driver lost concentration. And it was mostly as a feedback system for the drivers. But in fact, it's a score. I mean, it's one of those things where if I were trying to hire a driver, I'd look for that as a problem. Um, to me, it looks like that we're just scratching the surface yeah. for what simulators can do in the development of these systems. The more they become software platforms, we'll be developing the platform before the transportation portion's even done. It'll be substantially done. So I think that's really interesting. I know that NVIDIA is providing a lot of the horsepower for a lot of that. Yeah, stuff. the simulation, we believe that autonomous driving will not be done without the simulation because there are so many different um, corner cases that either you cannot go and find it by driving or you don't want to try corner cases, you yeah. know, putting a child in front of the, uh, the car or something to test that whether your car is going to stop. We are investing a huge amount of energy on the simulation. And when I'm talking about simulation, I'm not talking about just a driving simulation. I'm talking about how we can create a, a simulation that you can also simulate all the sensors around the car. Yeah. For instance, if you want to simulate the camera, you have to make sure that you are rendering photorealistic image. That camera is exactly the same in the computer versus in the field. Uh, so we are investing a lot, and each car company probably invests hundreds of millions of dollars to create these giant data centers to be able to drive a million miles every night. And um, Google announced a few days ago that every night they drive three million miles for the, every new algorithm that they develop. I think that's the only way autonomous driving will be tested, validated, and will be safe, uh, and will be shipped. Uh, this is a huge area that uh, we are trying to contribute as much as possible. Is Shu Yoshida out here? That'd be interested. My guess is that Gran Turismo does more miles than that every day. <laughs> so it would Probably. be interesting to see if we could be a place where your software going through a, tri a typical video game construct would at least learn some things. Actually, we used the game engine Did you? Uh, two, three years ago to cool. start the, our simulation effort, and we figured out that we need more higher fidelity graphics. That's why we bring in the iRay uh, uh, technology to the simulator. I think it's kind of fascinating. But the game engines really have lots of things that simulator needs. 
You have the graphics, you have the AI of how the other cars move around you. I think game engines are extremely close to a perfect simulator. We also have those messy human beings who are driving them at the same time that for some reason the yeah, pure computer simulators don't so far, quite create. So, so far, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got some time for questions. Anybody, let's see, I don't know if we have mics or not, but I've got my eyeballs. Anybody have any questions for the panel? Oh, come on, somebody's going to, I'm going to call on somebody. If you don't. <laughs> Come on, Bruce, help me out. Yep. Uh, this year is the 100 Indy 500. And I've raced it many years. I finished fourth, sixth, started front row. I want to win it this year. I don't have a program that yet. So I know you guys have big budgets. Who wants to? <laughs> 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 Might get it or, or back me or whatever. Um, I, yeah, it's, uh, those who don't know, it's the 100th anniversary of the Indy 500. I, we were talking about it at lunch. There are people coming out of the woodwork this year that haven't been there for years just because it's such a unique opportunity. Yeah, I know. When you compare it, it was the you know, 50 Super Bowl, uh, 50 uh, Daytona 500, and it's yeah. the 100 Indy 500. It's amazing. I'm not, I'm not from this country, but I feel so proud of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, and, and with the nature of where IndyCar is today, literally, you know, you cannot have driven until the 1st of May and still be competitive in the 500. It's the nature of the beast today. So. Yeah, for sure, and especially the Indy 500, you're there like two and a half weeks running every day, every day, every day. So uh, you become almost a specialist of that race, yeah. And, you know, uh, it used to be belief that you had to have a Chevy, but then maybe not. We'll have to see. <laughs> no, you have to have a Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> I had my best results in a Chevy. So. You did. There you go. There you go. Richard, can I ask yep. a question? Yep. Um, a gamers, game designers, I say we, we uh, are working on building incentives in our game to encourage behavior we want to see. How do we incent people to drive autonomously when we're used to, we've grown up our whole lives driving our own car. How are we going to, what can we do to get people to drive autonomously and not, and get behind, out from behind the wheel? It's a really good question. And, um, I think it sort of comes down to um, the nature of your trip. Again, this, you get into the service aspect of it because I'm with you. I've got a car that I adore that I want to be playing in the mountains and racing around with any time that I possibly can. But I also drive it up to San Francisco. And if I've got a meeting across town, I don't want to move it. I don't want to repark. And so I'll take a shared service or I'll take an autonomous vehicle and do that. Um, I think the way you encourage people to drive autonomously is to have them look at, break down their day into the different kinds of trips and the ones that you enjoy taking and the ones that you don't. And the ones that you don't enjoy taking are things like your commute, in which you'd be perfectly happy to let somebody else take it over for you if you knew you could be point to point in at least the same amount of time, if not less. Um, for the other trips where you are enjoying yourself, no. I mean, I can see people not wanting to do that. So I think it's, it's um, some people just don't want to drive ever. They're going to go autonomous straight from the start. I think the rest of us need to take a really hard look at the trips that we don't enjoy and think about whether we want to give those up and let you know, the car drive us itself. And basically the value proposition is going to solve the oh, problem yeah. for you. And then, of course, the other use case that I want, which I just have to add, is that you know, if you go someplace, parking is a pain in the butt. I want my car to let me out and then go park itself. Yeah. And it can, it can drive off and park itself wherever it needs to park and then come pick me up. I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, me, me too, me too. I, I, Bruce, I think there, the other interesting thing that's gonna happen, uh, you know, for me, an 18-wheeler driving I-95 from Las Vegas to Reno is, if there's a more ideal application of autonomous driving, I don't know what it is. I think in that particular case, what's gonna drive it is insurance companies. And, and I think in the long term, that's maybe the stick and I think it's maybe our job as game developers to come up with some of the candy at the other end, the things you can win or the things, the extra value that it creates in your car or the three new sound, you know, song downloads you get or whatever it is. Um, insurance companies have been pretty good at those positive incentives too. I think that's an opportunity. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yep. Is there a forum? Is there is this on? Is there a way that we can access you? Is there a way that you can access us that you formalize? Because this is such seems to be such a new idea as far as including us. You know, you guys have definitely been busy on this for a while. Um, so 
We've got a couple of things at GM in terms of getting new ideas in. My group specifically is focused on talking with startups. So if there's you know startups that have a new idea to do something interesting in a gamification space or something like that, we're, we're more than happy to talk with them and uh, figure out the right uh, method for integration. Um, GM does have a developer program for its in-vehicle app. Um, and so if you're kind of working on an app, you kind of can go over there and, and get access to some of the data that we have um, and, and figure out you know, how you can work with us that way. So there's a couple of ways to do it. We've still got a lot of work to do, I would say, but um, I'm always happy to chat with people too. Uh, I, I, once I got, a, you know, once she figured out that I wasn't crazy, <laughs> all of you know is still true, I'm still crazy, but, but she's very accessible. I found GM to be really accessible on this program. So that's one of those things, if you got an idea, knock on our door, literally. I, you might be surprised what you find. And so uh, I, I found working with them great. To me, this is one of the more exciting new things happening is the computing platforms that is transportation systems and all of the things that that's spawning. Um, I think it's a space for innovation. Obviously, I've been an electric vehicle fan for 20 years, but that's kind of the, the lower left-hand corner of it. EVs are not the outcome here. They're just the right facility yeah. for right. A, a local town-based autonomous car. It's clearly the right answer in that particular context. But in other cases, uh, you know, I also own, own a, grand, a, a gas turbine car, so I do like things that make noise too. Um, I think that the future can allow us to have a C9 Corvette and an <laughs> autonomous driving car at the same time. So I look forward to that future. Thanks for letting us talk to you guys, and we will see you later. Thank you. Thanks.